on behalf of my co-authors, I'm going to present our paper titled Time Fabric, Trust the Time for Permission Blockchains. So when we think of blockchain systems, we typically think of two roles that, that they play. Um, so the two things they, that they need to achieve are consensus on transaction order and consensus on transaction validity. Um, some systems start by achieving consensus and order and then validity. Some, some systems do it the other way around. So let's begin with permissioned blockchains, sorry, permissionless blockchains such as Bitcoin. So in, uh, in the case of Bitcoin, uh, first uh, consensus is achieved on transaction order and then on transaction validity. Um, so the, a system like this would be given a name of order, then execute. So uh, I'm showing here clients and a Bitcoin network consisting of six peers. So clients send transactions to the network and uh, then peers pick up the transactions, put them into blocks, uh, race to solve a cryptographic puzzle, and suppose peer number three uh, wins the race, so it's the first one to solve the puzzle. Um, it creates the block, um, uh, adds proof that it has solved the puzzle, and broadcasts the block to the other peers. And then all the other peers um, execute sequentially execute the transactions. So ordering happens first by way of putting transactions into blocks and then transaction execution. Now here's an example of a permissioned blockchain such as Hyperledger Fabric in, uh, in which the uh, transaction pipeline proceeds the other way around. Execution comes first and then ordering. So we have clients again, um, we have six peer nodes uh, and in Fabric, um, uh, peers are divided into peers that execute and validate and endorse transactions. And in, in this illustration, it's the three peers at the top. And then there are peers who only um, order transactions. And so in this illustration, it's peer number four, five, and six at the bottom. So clients will send uh, uh, transactions to the peers that, that execute them. Uh, in this case, peer one, peer two, and peer three. Um, each peer has a uh, database, a state database, uh, and this state database is versioned. So uh, the, the database consists of the current state, for example, current balance um, of, uh, the, uh, of the accounts um, that participate in, in the ledger. So in, in Fabric, this is a key value store. Each key corresponds to an account, for example, and the value corresponds to the current state of the account. And this state database is versioned because additionally, there is a, um, there is a current version of this key. So whenever a, a transaction happens and um, a balance of an account changes, for example, the version of this of the course, co corresponding key is incremented. Okay. So clients will send in their transactions. Um, and in a permission blockchain like, uh, like Fabric, um, some number of peers, maybe all of them, maybe half of them, will independently simulate the execution of the transaction. And what I mean by simulating the execution of the transaction is that uh, they will run the smart contracts, they will access the state database um, to see which keys are being accessed, what are their versions, and how will the values change. But at this point, the peers don't actually commit the changes caused by the transactions to the database. They simulate the execution of these transactions. And they send back an endorsement to the clients if the, uh, if the transaction executes properly. And this endorsement includes all the keys that were accessed during the simulated execution of the transaction, the old values, the new values of those keys, and the version numbers. Okay, so in the next step, um, all or some of the peers, depending on the application logic, will send back endorsements to the client. If these endorsements match, then the client can send its endorsed transaction to the peers that do the ordering. Okay. So the peers that do the ordering, they'll collect those endorsed transactions, assemble them into blocks, and then they will send the blocks back to the peers that execute transactions. And at this point, peers that execute transactions will commit the changes. To the state database. Okay, so at this point, the peers don't rerun uh, the the smart contracts. They only examine the endorsements that include the keys that uh, that need to be changed and their new values and the the version numbers, and they will make those changes. Now, here's a subtle issue, though. Uh, so at, at initially, 
clients can send transactions to peers and, and peers just simulate the effects of these transactions. So suppose we have a client who only has $10 left in their account. There's nothing stopping this client from uh, sending in five transactions that all uh, attempt to spend the last $10. And if those transactions are, are, um, um, are executed or if there's ex execution is simulated, then there will always be at this point $10 left in the account. The, uh, the state database will not actually be changed until the transactions are committed. So this is where version numbers come in. At this time, now that the peers are committing the, um, um, the effects of the transactions into the state database, they check to make sure that the keys that, whose values are changed still have the same version number as recorded when the transaction was endorsed. If that's not the case, then that means that that key was written to in between the endorsement and the attempted uh, commitment right now. Uh, and if that happens, then that transaction is not, I I is not committed. OK, great. So what's our problem? Well, the problem we study in this paper is let's take a permissioned system and can we modify it so that it can deal with transactions that include time-based logic? So two examples of time-based logic in a transaction are um, comparing the timestamp of a transaction against a deadline and the use of sliding windows within a smart contract. So for an example of a sliding window, let's consider a banking overdraft example. So in this example, a bank may allow a transaction to withdraw money that doesn't exist in the account um, as long as there aren't any suspicious transactions within a sliding window of transactions of, say, over the past hour. Okay, so this requires some notion of time. Now, here's what can go wrong. Um, so clients send in their transactions in a permission system such as Hyperledger Fabric, and then these transactions are uh, executed in a simulated manner independently by the, by the peers that execute transactions. Well, if those peers have local clocks that are not synchronized, they may actually, um, some peer may say that this transaction meets a deadline, another peer may say otherwise. Some peer may examine one sliding window and conclude that it looks good, that there aren't any suspicious transactions. Another peer whose clock is a little bit older may consider a different sliding window in which there may be a, um, a suspicious transaction. So in that case, we, can, we might not be able to reach consensus on the validity of the transaction. Some peer may think it's valid depending on or according to this peer's notion of time. Another peer may say it's not valid according to that peer's notion of time. So this suggests that consensus on transaction validity, if transactions include some notion of time, requires consensus on time. And this is the problem you want to solve in this paper. So our solution, called Time Fabric, um, is a lightweight solution to achieve consensus on time in permission blockchains. And we do so without the use of external oracles. So we want to make our solution self-contained um, in the sense that uh, the consensus of time should be reached without relying on, on, on any uh, third parties. And uh, we implemented a proof of concept on top of Hyperledger Fabric 1.4. So there are four modifications um, that we make in our solution to a generic design of a, of a permission system. So modification number one is what happens initially when clients send in their transactions for endorsement. So modification one, we need to modify the peers who endorse transactions to ensure that the transaction timestamps are within delta of the current trusted time. And I haven't yet defined current trusted time. I'll do so shortly, but this is the first modification. We need to make sure that the, the timestamps the clients put in the transactions um, are not too far into the past or too far into the future. Now here's modification number two. So suppose we have some notion of trusted time so peers will, uh, will make sure that transaction timestamps are OK. And then they will execute the smart contract. They'll use the current trusted time that I haven't yet defined um, to execute the smart contracts. They'll send back the endorsement. Clients will uh, get their transactions ordered as before. And then blocks go to the peers for commitment. At this point, here's modification number two. And now we get to the, to the bottom of the trusted time. So when peers are committing the transactions within the current block, they're going to assign a timestamp, one timestamp per block. And this will be our trusted time. And there are two 
um, at least two ways to assign this, this trust the time. One is to take the maximum timestamp of all the transactions within the current block. Another one is to take the median transaction timestamp of the transactions within the current block. And the median is a bit more resistant to, uh, um, to malicious clients. So let's say we're going to take the median. We're going to take all the timestamps of the transactions within the current block, which have already been verified as, no, as not being too far into the past or the future in the previous modification. So we're going to take all those transaction timestamps. We're going to take the median transaction timestamp within this block. We're going to add it to the block. We're going to add it to the ledger. This will be our timestamp of the current block, and this will be our um, this will be our trusted time. Okay. And now there's a there's a subtle issue here that this uh, transaction timestamp, or I should say the block timestamp, it has to be monotonically increasing. So we're going to take the median timestamp of the transactions within the current block, as long as this timestamp is larger than the timestamp of the previous block. If not, we're going to take the timestamp of the previous block plus a small epsilon. Okay. So at this point, putting it together, we have a block timestamp. Every block has a timestamp. Okay. This timestamp is monotonically increasing. And this timestamp is based upon um, previously verified transaction timestamps as not being too far into the past or the future. And this becomes our, uh, our ledger time that, um, um, that peers are going to use when executing smart contracts. It's basically the timestamp of the last committed block. This will be the trusted time. Okay? So instead of using local time, for example, the peers are going to use the timestamp of the previous last committed block as the current time. Okay? This is how we achieve consensus on time. Now, every, everybody or every peer uh, that, is, uh, <clears throat> that is endorsing and, and validating transactions has this uniform notion of current trusted time. This is the time that's going to be used to decide the state of the sliding window at the current time, and this is the time that's going to be used to, um, to compare against any deadlines specified in the smart contracts. Okay, great. Um, we still have two problems that we need to solve, though. Here's one problem. What if there are no transactions? So what if clients just uh, stay silent for, for an hour? Then, unfortunately, our time, our trusted time, would also stand still. So we need to somehow maintain um, um, time progression even if, uh, there aren't, uh, even if clients aren't sending any transactions. So for this, here's modification number three that we need to make. We need to um, create a dummy client that will periodically send uh, heartbeat transactions just to make sure the time moves forward if, uh, if clients aren't actually sending any transactions. Okay, well, we're not out of the woods yet. There's another problem that we need to solve. Um, and this has to do with sliding windows. So a client uh, submits a transaction for endorsement. And let's say this, this is an overdraft transaction or a transaction like that that requires access to a sliding window of recent account histories. Well, notice that state the state database uh, has no history. The state database only has the most recent or the current state of an account, for example, the current balance. So naively, if a peer needs access to the recent history, recent states of an account, it would have to go directly to the ledger, unpack the ledger and reconstruct the state, which is expensive, right? And throughput will suffer. We're not going to be able to, um, to get transactions endorsed and executed quickly if we have to go to the, uh, to the ledger to reconstruct transaction histories or account histories. So our, our solution, our modification number four in our design, is in addition to um, the state DB, um, peers that execute and validate and endorse transactions also will store a cache. And this cache will contain the, um, the effect, the recent, uh, recent modifications of keys. So the state database has the latest value of a key. Uh, the cache database will have a sliding window of recent uh, states of a key. Okay? Um, now, if we just keep dumping uh, history into, into the cache, the cache will grow indefinitely. And then uh, accessing the cache is going to be just, just almost as bad as accessing the ledger. So we need to maintain a cache over time. We need to expire um, old uh, states um, over time in the cache so that the cache only maintains a sliding window of recent data. Um, so one way to do expiration is to keep scanning the cache to see if there are, the, if there are any old uh, uh, states that need to, be, uh, need to be removed. That's expensive. So instead, um, our solution is to shard or partition the cache by time. So if the cache stores, let's say, the last 10 minutes of, uh, of transaction um, history or, uh, uh, or key histories, 
then we take that 10 minutes and for example we divide it into 10 parts one minute each and then every minute um, we just drop the last the last shard so this is how we can sort of lazily maintain uh, the cache over time or lazily uh, expire old uh, states um, in, in a batch manner rather than uh, scanning the entire cache database. Okay, and so here are some implementation details in Fabric version 1.4. So the first thing we need to figure out is what's the good value of delta. So initially when clients send in their transactions for endorsement, how far into the past or the future can we accept the timestamps to be? And so we set this value according to the underlying block timeout in Fabric, and which is two seconds. So to account for this, uh, for this delay, we set delta to be two seconds plus an epsilon, and the epsilon accounts for networking delays, basically. And now similarly, our dummy client frequency is also two seconds. Now, another thing we do in, in, in the context of the specific implementation is Fabric is uh, we change the API. We expose two methods that are, are now available to smart contracts. One is get time. So this method essentially, instead of, instead of um, um, accessing the current uh, local clock of a peer, it will access the current trusted time, the block time of the, of the previous block. And that time will be used in the smart contract. And furthermore, we, uh, we expose a, an, another method uh, uh, to fetch the window of recent uh, history for a given key. And this, this method can be used uh, uh, for access to a sliding window of history. Um, and in our experiments, um, all these modifications um, add up to about 3% overhead in terms of transaction throughput. Uh, which is not very high, and we notice that um, um, our cache database um, ends up being about twice as fast as uh, reconstructing uh, a history of uh, a recent history of uh, of account states directly from the ledger. And please see the paper for uh, further experimental details and further technical details of our solution. Thank you.